All right. I know throughout this whole um, podcast, you may hear dog noises in the background because both of my dogs have followed me up to the uh, the room where I'm, I'm recording. And I had to carry Toby up because, you know, he has uh, he has Lou Gehrig's disease now. Oh, no. So he can't walk very well. He can't go up and down stairs. So I just lugged him up here. And the other one, of course, came thundering up. So if you hear these odd, like, slurping noises, it's probably the dog. <laughs> I did not grow up with pets until I was about 14 and I got a bird. That was my first actual pet. I was crazy about the bird because I could get him to do all these little tricks and things. Then for the last few years, I've had dogs and um, really enjoyed animals and found not only were they good for me, but they were a good way of, um, of connecting with other people. And I'm not alone in this. Amy, I know you have um, a dog as well. And you and I are two of the 85 million American households that have pets. And what was interesting to me as we started thinking about this uh, episode was not just the number of people who have animals, but how much money gets spent over the lifespan of an animal. Um, our pets really are integral parts of our lives and communities. But what about you? Did you ever have um, animals growing up or pets besides the one you have now? I didn't get to have a, a pet until I was older because, you know, I don't know if it's because, but my dad grew up on a farm and so animals were not pets. They were part of the working community of a farm. And so to have a dog indoors in a, in suburban Washington, DC, that wasn't going to cut it. Um, that's not where he came from. But when, when we were all older and part of me was kind of wondering, well, maybe he was waiting till we could all help take care of the, of the pet. We were able to get a dog. Well, kind of a funny story. Our first pet was this uh, very rambunctious beagle basset hound mix who loved to go roaming. And when he got loose, he would um, steal things from my neighbor's garage, stole four different sets of shoes from four different pairs of shoes and ripped open a bag of English seed that my neighbor had brought back from England. So our pet was not well to, but my dog now actually has her own Instagram. Uh, yes, I, I have a, a gluten-free dog and she eats really, really well. And so I, I don't, I totally get the, the dog mom thing and enjoy uh, my, my wonderful puppy, but I would do it again because they bring, she brings such enjoyment and, and love to my, to my family and to my life. And, you know, I do think about stories that have shaped my life growing up. Uh, old Yeller movies, um, oh, yeah. favorite books, Make Way for Ducklings, A Cricket in Times Square, Charlotte's Web. All of those have captivated our hearts and fueled literacy development and generated an economic benefit from them as well. Well, yeah, you know, Charlotte's Web was the first book that I remember reading. That was what turned me on to, to books, actually, was Charlotte's Web. So anyway, at the afterward table tonight, we have Rich Williams and Brett Tepper, the innovators and creators of Mod Cat, the award-winning litter box for modern cats to do their business. So welcome, Rich and Brett. Hi, I'm Holland Webb. Hi, I'm Amy Bolin. And you're listening to The Afterward, a conversation about the future of words. I just love that tagline. <laughs> <laughs> or modern cats do their business. It, yeah, I, I think that's very clever. It was a fun uh, thing to have to come up with. Uh, you know, it's, an, it, it's always a funny topic. And if you can't uh, find some wit in that, then there's something wrong with you. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Brett, tell us a little bit about the Mod Cat story. It was actually uh, uh, Rich's brainchild. Um, his wife was pregnant at the time. And, um, I actually, I think Rich would probably be the best to, uh, to explain how it originated. And then I can kind of, uh, tell All right, well, let's start end. with Rich then. Yeah. <laughs> Brett likes to tell the story, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you my perspective of it. Um, so yeah, it was actually my wife who, who kind of pushed us over the, the, the edge with the idea. But, um, before we had kids, we didn't have any pets and we were living in a small apartment in Brooklyn. And so my wife 
grew up with pets her whole life and she wanted to have cats uh, after we got married. So she was like, I want to have these cats. And I was like, I don't know. I felt like it, it would be a responsibility and I wasn't ready for it and I wasn't sure about it. But she was like, no, no, let's get these cats. So we ended up getting two cats. No, actually, no, no, one cat, one cat at first. And uh, we lived in an apartment building that, that, where the landlord didn't allow pets. So it, it was our, our first apartment together. He didn't allow pets. He had a big giant dog, but he wouldn't allow anybody else to have pets in the building. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, we, we got this cat and we snuck it up to, to the apartment and the cat would meow every night really loudly at the door. So we, we, were, very, we were nervous the whole time. We were, so it added this whole element of sort of nervousness and excitement two people that never had a cat together, an animal together, a pet together. So it was kind of fun and, and exciting. And uh, that was a long time ago. Then that cat was, ended up being pregnant. So we had baby cats, kittens, and we ended up giving them away to all of our family members and friends. And we kept one. So then we had two. And then we moved to another apartment, a bigger apartment. And that's when my wife got pregnant and she she wasn't able to take care of the cat litter box anymore. I was doing it mostly anyway, but she couldn't do it at all. And then I really started to get into it. And I started to realize that I didn't like how the cat litter box worked or how it looked in our apartment. So I kept complaining to her every night. This is ridiculous. I can't find a nice cat litter box. I'm searching online every night. I'm looking everywhere, trying to find boutique brands and, and you know anything, anybody that can have a nice, nice looking cat litter box. And there was nothing out there. And finally, she got sick of me saying that every night to her. So she was like, you're a designer. Go design one. Because Brett and I had a design business before this. And uh, the light bulb went off in my head. And I was like, yeah, why, why, why do I have to wait to find one when I could, we could just design one? So uh, I, I brought it into Brett. And, and funny enough, Brett went to school for industrial design. So he has a degree in industrial design, but he never used it because he got into web design after that. So Brett got excited about it because... He thought it was a good idea, first of all, but then he had a chance to really, you know, exercise his design skills in industrial design, which is nice. And and not um, only that, but uh, but we had uh, previously uh, done a project for a big box store, and uh, in our graphic design business, which we had previous to this business, and um, it actually ended up taking us to Asia, and we met with we were in all these factories and met all these people there and um one of the guys the guy who actually hosted us he was actually just a translator for us um he was uh, actually taiwanese and we had this uh this great trip with him he was just a super guy he was about our age he had uh, a wife and we had very similar lives even though we were uh, a world apart and um, we kept in touch with him. And um, when Rich had the idea, we started to really get excited about it. Uh, the first person we called was him. And uh, you know, we hadn't seen him in a year, but we kept in touch with him over the time. And uh, he was so excited and he, he told us to come. So Rich and I, not long after, hopped on a plane with um, a couple of designs in our laptops and we brought it over there. And uh, he had a prototype waiting for us. And it was amazing. We just had this, you know, it just all came together and, uh, and, and we made it happen. That's such a great story. And it's interesting too, how necessity is the mother of invention and, you know, having that design eye, um, having a problem and, and solving it, uh, but also having that connection to your friend um, that you made in Taiwan. Uh, what, you know, just kind of bringing cultures and communities together through animals and, and that's the, the topic of, of our podcast tonight is, you know, what is the draw that animals have on our communities and our economies and our heartstrings? And you just kind of demonstrated that yep. um, with that connection. Yep. That's and it was funny because he had a dog in the first prototype we saw. He actually had his dog on top of it and going inside of it and stuff. And, uh, you know, he, he had to pick him up and put it in, but, um, you know, we had this connection with him and, uh, he really, uh, you know, loved the idea of us working on this with him, even though at the time it wasn't really what he did, but, uh, he was so excited to work with us that, uh, he made it all happen. Wow. That's wonderful. Yeah. These friendships that sort of form around animals, that's really showing up right now during COVID-19. Some of the, um, during this pandemic that we're in as we're recording this, animal shelters are running out of animals to adopt. Everybody wants a companion. Uh, and, and I guess right now, if you're stuck at home and you don't have another person, having a cat or a dog really 
helps fill that need for, for companionship and affection and, and some level intimacy. And studies have actually shown, you know, that humans show similar levels of empathy toward animals as they do to people. Um, what do you, what do you think about that? How does that show up in everyday life? How does that uh, demonstrate uh, that we have empathy for people or for creatures of other species? Well, it certainly showed up in my life every day because I have, I, I, I used to have two cats, but I only have one cat now and I have, but I just got a new puppy. So I have a, a puppy and a cat and I'm really here to represent the cats because we talk about dogs enough, but I understand now why people talk about dogs so much is because the dog is in my face 24 <laughs> seven, you know, and we definitely bonded and, you know, the energy is so different between the two. She's, uh, she's very much like, dad, what are we doing now? Where are we going? Come on, take me out. Let's go somewhere. And my cat's like, chill, you know, well, I'll come up to you on my time and, you know, I'll sit on your lap later on tonight. But we do our, we do bond in, in very different ways, but uh, it, it is certainly a bond. And I think that this, this COVID situation is definitely going to birth a whole new community of first time pet owners. And I think it's people that might have not been able to get a pet before because of time constraints. They, could, they had to go to offices and they couldn't, you know, walk the dog or take care of uh, an animal. But now I think that it's going to open this whole thing up. And I think a lot of people are going to maybe even want to change their lives around having animals. And in addition to that, I think that millennials, you know, at least the millennials I've spoken to, they were of the mindset, a lot of them are of the mindset that they don't even want to have kids. So they're not, either they can't afford it or they have environmental concerns or other, other concerns. And it's just not in the game plan to have kids for them. So they're, they're kind of making pets their, their children. So I, I think animals are definitely offering, I don't know, companionship for, for humans right now. So, I mean, they always have, but it's going to expand, I think. Yeah, there was an, uh, I, I saw a Wired article uh, talking yeah. about what you were talking about, uh, Holland, with the uh, shelters being empty now, uh, because uh, like Rich was saying, uh, people aren't traveling and, um, you know, they, they don't have the responsibility of going into and uh, commuting to work every day. Um, so they all of a sudden have this time and, and extra space and, uh, in their lives for, for another being. And I, th I think it's, uh, become really popular. And it's kind of exciting. Um, yesterday the, and when we drop this, this episode, it will have been several weeks past, but, uh, we are celebrating the 50th year of, of earth day. And one of the interviews was with Jane Goodall and she uh, was talking about how when she first went to um, do her research that uh, she had named the chimpanzees and, you know, identified personality traits and that kind of thing. And then, then she went to grad school and they said, no, you're doing this all wrong. You must number the animals, no names, you know, just keep it very sterile. And she's like, but my dog Rusty has personality. I can see the personality of these, of these chimpanzees. Um, so it is kind of interesting as you both were talking. I do hope that through this experience of COVID that maybe others are finding the joy of, of pet ownership and, and maybe experiencing it in a way that had this not happened, they wouldn't have had that opportunity. Um, so I think you've both definitely hit on some very important points. In the 1800s and the 1900s, many stories as I was sharing about with my dad uh, portrayed animals as part of family, but as workers, but not as pets. Um, even the movie, All Creatures Great and Small, and even Lassie. Uh, but how do we talk about animals today? And I believe, Brett and Rich, you all have a blog about cats, for instance. So you know, I'm not sure who would like to take a shot at this first, but how do we talk about our animals today? I'll, I'll start off. I think, I think, I love the idea of, of animals as working animals to farm. I, I, I think that's really cool. I, I think animals, you know, like my dog would love to go to work right now. My, <laughs> my dog would love to be like herding sheep, you know? So I think that's, that's awesome because I feel like they, they have that instinctually in them to want to do certain things. Um, but at the same time, I think in America today, animals are definitely children, considered to be children of, of part of the family, right? So um, I think it's a, different, it's a different mentality or it's changed, you know? And I think now they've become part of the family that, you know, in, in, in our case, at least gets spoiled and, and, and loved on. And, you know, it's just another part of the family. There's no place for my, my, my dog to go to work <laughs> Let's put it that way. I mean, if there was, I'd probably send her there. <laughs> but, um, but now I think people just want to have a fun companion. And there's a lot of benefits to having pets and domesticated pets, you know, like 
if you're like in the situation now, if you're living alone, you're probably feeling very lonely. I know I have friends who are doing that now. They just want to get out of the house and they feel lonely. But if you have a pet, you, you, you know, that takes away some of that loneliness as it gives you to, something else to care for besides yourself, you know? I think another thing um, that surprised us when we began the business is um, we got to know our customers uh, from trade shows and from customer support emails. And um, one of the things that we were so shocked by is people really feel like they have this uh, tight connection with their, with their pets, like they know what they're thinking. One of the first responses we started to receive when we came out with ModCat, which was um, ModCat is a top entry litter box, which is one of the first of its kind. Um, where the cat goes down in through the top instead of into the front or the side of the box. And so, so customers had this uh, preconceived notion their animals would never do it. And I just found myself saying to them, have you ever thrown a box on the floor? You know, the first thing a cat does is jump into the top of the box and they don't even think about it. You know, it's just a natural thing. And, um, you know, after, you know, having this conversation often with customers, um, I started to mention that anecdote over and over again, and then also talk about how, um, you know, mod cats about the same as the, uh, the seat height of, a of, of a couch or a, a standard chair. So if, if your cat can get up on either of those, it's, it's kind of a no brainer. Um, so it, it, it's funny that the, that customers just had this thought that, you know, they understood the, their animal better than anyone else. And that always amused me. I think that's an excellent point. You know, I think sometimes, um, both to Rich and, and Brett, your point, we have domesticated animals so much that we have personified them. You know, we, we think they've taken on human characteristics and we've forgotten that they're actually animals. Um, in some cases. And so I love that story about, you know, having to remind uh, the the cat owner that, yeah, this is, this is normal operating procedure. Um, there's a great documentary about the domestication of dogs and how all dogs come from wolves and how each dog has a role. And the, the one guy at this uh, wolf research facility was saying, you know, you go to the pound and you choose the dog that comes to you and you think, oh, it's so cute. It's so cute. It's coming to me. And he said, what you've actually done is decided that you want the most aggressive dog of the pack because that dog that comes to you is the scout and its role is to scout for the pack, you know, but we just don't think <laughs> about that sometimes. So that, that's right. a great point. I love that. <laughs> I actually, I actually really quickly, I really, I have a friend, a couple friend who has a dog and the, the wife is very much about the dog's a, a, guy, a, a human and like you know, a human personality and the, 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 he, he likes this and that. And the husband grew up on a farm and he's very much like, this is a dog. You know, I love it, but it's a dog and it likes to run, go outside in the rain and smell dirty things and roll in the, you know, dirty grass. And she's like, no, no, <laughs> they, they fight about this. It's crazy. It makes sense. You know, we, uh, Amy, you mentioned earlier, uh, all creatures, great and small. I loved those books. Those books were just, you know, there's the short stories about the vet in the Yorkshire Dales from what was it, the 1920, 19, early 1930s, I think, to maybe the early 1970s. And that was a time you'd see this one story about, you know, a farmer who whose only interest in the cow or whatever they were taking care of was the milk or the meat that that animal was going to produce. And then the next one, there would be uh, some uh, more upper class person or some younger person, maybe who was in a little bit different place, who was terribly worried about the emotional impact of, of uh, something happening on their dog. And you kind of saw both those things playing together at the same time. In a way, we don't really see that much anymore because we never see the animals that uh, become food. You know, we see the pets, right. and that's kind of yeah. it. But um, I was I was going to ask you, um, Rich, what do you think is going to be kind of the future of pet products. Um, uh, we've talked a little bit about how perceptions of animals are changing and how, you know, I know Brett mentioned about how we as pet parents um, tend to think of the animals as human in a way or as having these human characteristics. How's that going to affect pet products, you think? That's a really good question because I don't necessarily have an answer for it mm -hmm. because I also <laughs> don't know. I just, I think they're already out there. I think, I think they're, you know, we're feeding 
dogs, you know, freshly baked biscuits from the, the dog bakery, you know? So I think those kinds of things are already out there um, where, where they're appealing to our senses as the animal is, is kind of human-like, right? So um, little outfits and things like that. As far as we we're concerned, I don't know how that will change for us. I mean, with our products, we try to appeal to the person and the animal. So we want a really super well-functioning cat litter box for the cat, but also something that looks nice in the home for the human. And um, works well for the human. Yeah, and works well for the human, right? So I think we're, we're sort of on that, that track as far as making things that might feel human-ish for an animal. That's not really what we're doing. I don't know where that's headed, to be honest with you. I don't know if Brett has any thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, one of the things that we've learned over time, and and I think our original intent, even though we hadn't really um, uh, probably conceived it uh, at the outset, was um, that we designed things to sort of spoil the animal as well. I mean, uh, most of the market that existed for cats um, I think dogs were were more advanced because you know there's a much more larger market for it. However, with cats, we found that most products were just were just going to buy the cheapest one we could find on Amazon. Um, and what we did was create um, a premium market, um, but not only you know that it was going to look better, but it was going to function better and be better for the the owner and the cat as a whole you know, doing a full height box. So a lot of cats that, you know, pee sideways and, you know, it makes a tremendous mess and it's for both the animal and for the, for the parent and, and our boxes address that and most didn't. So I think that was a big thing, but also a lot of people told us along the way that they did things like drill holes in their cabinets and um, have a place for the cat to, to exist in, in their home. And a lot of people told us that now they won't have to do something like that. Um, we even had interior designers approach us at trade shows and say, I just spent a year designing a, a cat cutout in a closet somewhere. And now I wouldn't have had to do that if your product had been around a year before. Um, so, you know, it's like we're introducing furniture for cats that didn't really exist before. And I think, um, I think that, is going to become more commonplace in the future. I think that's fascinating. And, you know, when I think about it, I think there were two cases of, I think they were cats that just came down diagnosed with COVID. And they said they're recovering, which is great. But, you know, when I think about something that sounds, and I'm hearing words like function, appeal to the person and the pet, um, that functionality piece I'm going to say might be the wave of the future. When I think about, you know, if you are having to worry about not infecting another animal or, you know, not having that disease transfer, there may be some other things coming down the pike that, that may need to be looked at. But those, those key words are, I think are, are part of that pivoting um, that we are seeing in the marketplace right now. That's a really good thought. Thanks for that idea. We're going to put that into our next product. <laughs> yeah, you can just, you know, tag the afterword, you know, give us a little, give, give us a little idea cred. We'll, we'll take it. We'll, we'll have little cat masks. There you go. There you go. Uh, well, if you ever come to Greenville, we have these bronze uh, mice and um, it comes from a book, Good Night Moon. And um, someone has gone around and put little masks on the bronze mice. It's, it's That's really funny. cute. It's funny. <laughs> well, functionality. So Brett, tell me, what do you think is an essential element we need to understand surrounding animal stories? You've kind of hit on a few, but what do you think? Uh, in, I'm sorry. In, in what way do you mean, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Brett. I just got distracted. <laughs> Because Rich just brought his cute little baby <laughs> to the screen. My little dog. She's a good what's, girl. What's your dog's name? Her name's Riley. Riley. Okay, well, there's an essential element right there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, but yeah. We were, we were, when we conceived this story or this topic, we were talking about the emotion that comes from uh, animal stories. You know, you can read a story about a dog or a cat and be as much or more touched than a story about a person. 
um, when something happens. So what do we need to know to understand why there's that, that strong sense of connection or that why, why do animal stories touch people's hearts the way that they do? I ask this question as I'm watching Rich kiss the top of his dog's head. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it goes back to the whole idea of um, uh, pets becoming children. Um, you know, the example that I have is that um, my father, who um, only had a pet when, when I was a kid, we had a cat. And we had him for, I had him for about 14 years. Um, but after that, um, uh, you know, my parents were divorced. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> my parents were divorced and, um, I, you know, so I hadn't lived with my father all through high school and, um, and then, uh, you know, I went off to college and so, you know, I didn't have this, um, close tie with my father and, um, my, he had moved down, uh, he had retired and moved down to Miami. And when he moved down there, I just started dating my, my current wife <laughs> and, um, her name is Sam. And my father just at the same, I think it was like the same week had rescued a dog and he had never had a pet since I was a kid. And the dog's name was Sam. And it was this whole strange thing. And um, my father and I started to get closer again. I hadn't had this tight relationship with him. But since he moved down to Miami, I started to visit him quite often. It was uh, around the time that I was finishing college. And it was this weird kind of thing where he started to form this relationship with a dog at the same time that I was forming a relationship with my soon-to-be wife. And um, we both had these Sams in our lives all of a sudden. And, you know, to this day, his dogs are, are more important to, to him than me. So it's incredible how tight relationships could be with a pet and, uh, you know, how, um, it, you know, really changes your life. That's absolutely true. Uh, Rich, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, I would say that those stories, those stories about animals being so touching and even more touching sometimes than humans is because uh, animals, uh, they're unconditional love and that's all they are. That's it. So there's no bad feelings, really. <laughs> you know, it's not, there's no, there's no hangups. There's no, there's nothing except for, for the love they give you. And, and, and that's every day and it's all day. So that's why you feel for them. You know, you feel with, from where they're coming from. Yeah, they have a certain vulnerability, don't they? Yeah, without a doubt. Well, especially my, my dog does, for sure. I mean, my dog is like, she's like a Velcro dog. She's like stuck to me. She comes with me. She, she looks, she's like looking at me like, where are we going, Dad? What are we doing? What's next? What, <laughs> what, what do you need from me? What can we do? Do I need to do anything for you? Look at her. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, yeah. and, you know, animals have that, 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 some of those same type of heartstring pulls until they destroy your door frame or... It's the three thousand dollar vet bill or whatever, you know. Those are the kinds you're kind of going. Why am I doing this? <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. My my cat on the okay. So before we wind up this first half here, can you tell us really quickly what's Mod Cat? Tell us about the products. Yeah. So I, I started to touch on it earlier, but um, you know, Mod Cat is mainly a company that instead of starting. Um, from the approach of, you know, we're, we're doing this thing that you have to have and we're going to make it as cheap as possible. Um, we are design at the heart. And um, when we started the company, it was all about design. Um, and when I say design, it's not just an aesthetic thing. As I was saying before, it was really about function. You know, our focus group was really um, downloading every review of every litter box on Amazon at the time. And we, we literally... Uh, taped them to the wall of our office. We had them all over the place. We read everything about it, every complaint of every litter box. And we tried to address everything. Um, you know, honestly, it was hard to figure out sort of the top uh, five points that were the most crucial. Um, but one of them, um, you know, after all this conversation about, you know, being so tight with your animal or whatever, but one of them was um, a human issue where the cats tracked litter all over the house. And that was a huge issue that customers uh, complained about with all these litter boxes. And so um, we can't take credit for having been the first to do a top entry litter box, but um, we 
uh, took the idea of another um, company that was doing it. But what they had done is they basically took a Rubbermaid box with a lid and cut a hole out of the top. Our approach to that, um, because we, we had one in, in our office and we saw how clumsy it was and litter would end up on top, but when you remove the lid, the litter would pop all over the place. And it was like, oh God, you had this great idea and you just didn't execute it properly. And so, you know, we, we kind of turned it all around and, and made it so that um, the lid hinged and it hinged at a third of the way from the rear of the box so that anytime you open the lid, the litter would just fall back into the box. And so we really considered um, the, the useful function of a litter box and what, it, what the core elements of it were. And the other part of it was we had always had um, reusability and, and um, you know, the green aspect in mind. So we talked about liners, and that was a huge complaint from customers, you know, these thin plastic garbage bag liners that once the cat touched it, it ripped. And, you know, you'd take it out and litter would pour all over the place. And, you know, so we spent like a full year trying to figure out a liner system. And what we ended up with was using um, probably the toughest uh, fabric that we could find, which turned out to be um, tarpaulin. And so we incorporated a, a sewn fitted liner into our litter box. And then we discovered quickly that the problem with that was keeping it up and um, keeping the cats from pulling it down. So we incorporated a, a metal band around the um, circumference of the uh, top of the bag that kept it taut and in place and made it so the cats, the cats can't pull that down. Um, so there were a lot of considerations in that respect, and we've since incorporated most of these aspects into all of our products. Um, we started out with ModCat, and then we, um, we have since, over the past 10 years, uh, developed um, three other litter boxes. We have a tray now. Uh, we've got a front-entry litter box because there were definitely some cats that just, you know, older cats or, um, you know, just stubborn cats that didn't want to use a top-entry litter box. So we um, decided to just do a beautiful front entry um, that also incorporated the, the liner, the reusable liner. And, um, and then we also did, instead of it having uh, a seam in the middle, because most companies would develop a litter box to be cheap to ship. So the litter box had a hood and a base. And the problem with that is cats were peeing sideways and it would inevitably leak outside of the the seam of the litter box so all of our litter boxes are as high as possible without seams with these full height liners that don't leak and uh and then we've got a lid on that product that articulates into into two separate sections allowing for more flexibility and easier access to clean it um so all of these things kind of go into it and then we also have the aesthetic of it which is super important because we were designing it initially for rich and for people that live in an urban environment who don't have the space to hide the litter box. So we wanted something that could be out and be a piece of furniture and not be so obviously this disgusting mass in your living room or your kitchen or your bathroom. That was a huge uh, consideration for us as well. And uh, we've, we've incorporated that into all the products. I would add to that, that ultimately we, we were talking about dogs a lot, but I would say that cats have as much unconditional love and loyalty, maybe more than dogs. You just have to earn it from them, right? So, um, but I, w- I would say that, um, for, you know, as a cat focused company, we want cats to be adopted. And there's a lot of cats out there that don't have homes. So we want a, a big challenge, a big obstacle for, for people to, to own cats in apartments or elsewhere was the litter box. They told us that. They said that the litter box is disgusting. We don't like it. Only cat works. Um, so if we could offer a solution that gets more cats adopted and gets them more homes, then, you know, we'll, we'll be very happy. I am so excited about that. I'm hearing those four words, useful, reusability, aesthetics, and then breaking down barriers for the, the animal. And that, uh, what a great concept, uh, to this. This is, this has been pretty, um, Interesting. I've learned a lot about um, just th- con- considering not just a product, but also um, kind of the the whole animal experience, um, not just from a pet parent point of view, but um, just all of the 
concepts that go into that. I'm, I've been enlightened to date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where, where can we buy a ModCat? ModCat.com? Or um, on Amazon, we have a, a ModCat page. And if you just search ModCat, you'll get all of our products as well. And it's M-O-D-K-A-T dot com. M-O-D-K-A-T dot com. All right. Yeah. Well, this is such a wonderful topic and helps lighten the news. Um, some good news in these current global situations. But we want to um, continue this conversation. So please join us next week as we conclude our conversations with these creative guests. And don't forget to subscribe, be part of the Afterward family. Please leave us a review. And as always, you are welcome at our table. <laughs>